Praise God. Praise God. God is good. Powerful ministry this morning. Transformation. That what God is able to do. And there were many witnesses for that. I want to thank Pastor Brown for inviting me, us, to the conference here and for the privilege to minister here to you. It's, I, I'm really humbled and I stand before you and I want to bring a word of God for you. Uh, if you have your Bible, open up in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and we're going to read a few verses from there. On Friday, September 21st, 2021, a good four months after the discovery a baby boy was buried. The burial took place at 10 a.m. at the St. Michael Cemetery in Berlin, Mariendorf, police said. The funeral service was open to the public, giving everyone the opportunity to say goodbye to the young child. No one knows his parents. In May, a man was walking his dog and he discovered the dead boy in a park. So his dog was tracking down the body between bushes and leaves on a Saturday night. The autopsy showed that the boy was alive when he was born. And then he was killed shortly after that. Investigation searched with man trailer dogs for possible traces for the child's mother so far in vain. In similar cases, the, in the past, it is known that mothers, they find themselves in a desperate situation and they don't know any other way out. Many hospitals in Germany, they provide baby hatches and they consist of a warm bed in which the child could be placed from the outside. And after a short delay to give the person the opportunity to leave anonymously, an alarm is set off and so nurses come and they find the baby. It is terrible when a baby is abandoned. Usually a mother goes wild when it's about her child. Usually a father goes wild. Think, think about you, think about your child. You would do anything. You would, you would fight for your child. How about our spiritual children? I want to preach on follow-up from 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 from 1 to 14. And for the sake of time, I only read verse 7 to 12. And I hope to leave you with something practical this morning. A terrible, it's terrible when a baby is abandoned. So our spiritual babies, they must live. Our spiritual baby, they must mature, not only survive, and we need to do everything to create a caring atmosphere in our churches. Second Thessalonians 2 verse 7. But we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. So affectionately longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. For you remember, brethren, our labor and toil for laboring night and day, that we might not be a burden to any of you. We preach to you the gospel of God. You are witness. And God also, how devoutly and justly and blameless we behaved ourselves among you who believe. As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you, and the Father does his own children, that you would have a walk worthy of God who calls you into his, into his own kingdom and glory. Father, we come before you. We ask you, God, to minister right now to your people. God, we ask you, Holy Spirit, God, that you, that you refresh the word and that you impart it into our lives. Thank you, Jesus, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's firstly look at the trauma or at the enemies of a new convert. Usually it's a great joy when a baby is born, a family prepares, and but I can guarantee that when a baby is born, you also will have sleepless nights. And... If you are involved in follow-up, you will encounter sleepless nights too. <laughs> if a, uh, the life of a newborn baby, that it starts with a cry. 
It just comes out of the womb, and surely it was pretty tight in this mother womb, and now it's out there, and it lies in the bright light on a table, and there are doctors and nurses all, all around it, and light is on, and, you know, maybe there's a clap on the back, and the baby starts to scream. Just look through the eyes of a new convert coming to church. And often what a new convert sees or a visitor in church, what he sees is very strange to his sight. I mean, a sinner who spends ruining his life for the last 20 plus years, whatever, doing all kinds of stupid things, and now he comes to church and he sees you and me, you know, dressed with a shirt and with a tie and, you know, all this... The, it, it may alienate him. You know, I was bewildered when I got saved in, in Australia and Darwin. The first time I went to church, you know, people, they looked pretty good. You know, I came as a traveler, and they sing some songs, and when they started to worship God, they started to raise their hands, and as a German, you don't raise your hand. <laughs> That's not what you do. I was, I was bewildered. This is... And this was just strange to me. And, and, and remember, you know, a, a convert is in a war right now. Especially, you know, it's, it's not against flesh and blood. Okay, sometimes it's against flesh and blood. But the, there is a real enemy, and he shows up, and especially two new converts, and he comes to kill, to steal, and to rob and destroy. And the devil is a very good follow-up worker, and he will use anything to destroy your new convert. So he uses people outside the church to destroy the new believer, but sadly he uses also people in the church to destroy a new believer. First, enemies outside the church. And, and remember, this church in Thessaloniki was born on the second missionary of, of a journey of Paul in uh, 49 AD, Acts chapter 17. And Paul, he chose the way through the synagogue. And very soon there were a sharp dispute that eventually led to the persecution of the young Christian community. Verse 2, but even after we had suffered... We were bold in our God to speak to you the gospel of God in much conflict, or also in contention, Acts 17, 5 and 7. But the Jews who were not persuaded, becoming envious, took some of the evil men from the marketplace and gathering a mob, set all the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason. They dragged Jason and some of his brethren to the rulers of the city, crying out, these who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And then here is the reality of evangelizing. Paul is doing what we do today. So the moment Paul starts to be fruitful, they lie about him. They lie about him publicly. They didn't have Twitter at that time, but it was working at that time. And, and they spread untruth. They slander him. They talk about him as if he was evil. And then they pull people to their side. They, they pull the city council to their side. Only three weeks spent at Paul in this city. There were enemies from outside. It does not take long when someone gets saved that all of a sudden the old friends show up out of the nowhere and then they want to pay their drug debt over the last 10 years back to this buy. The old, old, old girlfriends come. And even the parents, you know, who haven't been to a church for the last 20 years, now they decide to start their religious life again, but not in this church. And, you know, when I got saved in Darwin, I wrote letters back to my friends in Germany. And, you know, one, one of the letters... I wrote to a friend, Bodo, and I told him, God, I, I found a new life in Jesus Christ. And he really changed my life. There is an answer. And, and he said, hold out, Frank. We will come and get you out of there. <laughs> so, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> I guess I was enthusiastic. <laughs> this enemies from the outside. There is work 
a new job offer comes up, career opportunity. So in Darwin, I was there for a couple of weeks, and, and the first job offer was to, to build a tourist resort in the outback. You know, for me as a carpenter, I go out with a chainsaw and with the boys and, you know, cutting down trees, building a tourist. That would be great. You know, but this would mean that I couldn't be in church because we would leave on Sunday afternoon and then be there all week long. And God's will has an address. When you as a pastor do everything that you can to get people into church, it seems like the devil is doing everything to make sure that it doesn't happen. And sometimes it's not just the devil. Sometimes it's like people in church are doing everything to, to scare people away. And that's an amazing truth. There are enemies from inside friendly fire. This is a very sad reality in war and it happens in churches too. Not on purpose, but by accident. It's tragic. Like Alec Baldwin shot camera woman, Helena Hutchins. Tragic. So the devil wants to destroy fruit and we are at war. The, the fight for the soul is not over, it just began. And the devil is a good follow-up worker, and he will use anything to destroy the new convert. And if we want to keep the new converts, we must understand that the world and the flesh and the devil are convert killers. He uses people outside the church to destroy new believers. Sadly, he also uses people in the church to destroy new believers because of carnality, because of rebellion, because of gossip because of immorality, because of division or cliques in the church, fruit can be destroyed. Some seemingly well-meaning Christians, they put too much pressure on new converts. There is legalism. A new convert must dress like us. Must cut hair. I'm glad. Take out earrings, piercings, immediately. You know, do what all Christians do. No cinema, no cross. The list pastor, Pastor Mitchell mentioned, list of things to get rid of, list of things to start to do, huh? list of things to stop doing. And language, decide for church. I had a guy in church, and he was praying after a concert at the altar with the, with the visitor. He just came in, and he got saved. He raised his hand, and then later on, I saw them talk at the altar, and I saw the gestures, and then I, I saw this, this visitor just taking off his, his necklet and, and give it to him. And, and later on, I asked the brother from the church, so what was that? And he said, this guy, he had this rosary. And I explained it to him that the devil has access to his life through this rosary. I tell you, the devil had access to his life, but not necessary to this rosary. <laughs> but needless to say that he was never coming back again. Acts 15, 1 and 5. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Yes, you are in the potter's house, now you can't have a TV. No TVs anymore. And no boyfriends. You know, in... Such cases, I, I forbid people to do follow-up work. You know, I take them aside and I, I tell them, you know, I love you, but this is not your gift. <laughs> you, you have other gifts, but not this one. Stay away from converts, <laughs> new converts, and, and don't take their number. Underline. 
So remember, if, if you are doing follow-up work and a new convert dies a mysterious death, <laughs> you, you may want to investigate what happened. But, but we could kill people out of a lack of wisdom, out of a lack of understanding. So let people grow according to their understanding. Uh, only long after Jesus had served, he mentioned the cross for the first time, not while pioneering. So this does not mean that he covered anything up or he hid anything. He was just wise. He preaches repentance and faith in God and Jesus, and that's what people need. You, you don't need to mention the tithe. When, when, they, when they are saved, they find it out by themselves very soon in the word of God or they hear pastor preach on it. And, and then they got the desire to do it. They will deal with it themselves. When, when, when things are expected, when things are demanded, and, and they have a tie and, and, you know, death is on the way. Have you ever heard about the tithe? And, and, you know, Jesus says, there are many things I wanted to tell you, but you were not ready for them. And, and these were the disciples just after three years. Paul, I gave you milk, not meat. You were not ready for the meat. This is not hiding, okay? This is just wisdom. And you don't need to talk about the, the TV. When, when he is saved, when she is saved, you know, it's, it's not a matter. They, they, they will deal with it themselves. Crazy and strange teachings. Crazy and strange people, rebellious people. Hymenaeus and Philetus, they don't make good follow-up workers. Their word will eat like cancer. Immorality is a convert killer. You know, church is not the world. Amen. It, it, you know, it's just heartbreaking when, when a man or when a woman comes to the church and when they got the same pickup line as they do in the world. The carnal brother, the carnal sister. Is that possible in our churches? I have seen this, real conversions. And then suddenly, the people who are not right with God, who are impure, you know, they attach themselves on the new convert and ask for the phone number. And this is why we have this absolute rule. Before you go out, you wait six months, maybe longer. And this is a desperate attempt to protect precious life from the hyenas and from the carnal and from the pity thieves. There are more reasons for trauma in new converts, division and strife. Church kids can cause a trauma in new believers, carnal lifestyle. But let's look at our text and examine, secondly, the conduct of Paul. Because he talks about how gentle he was toward them. He did not make demands. He talks about how their life was an example and how they cared for them. We had a heart for you, like parents have it for their children. And this text is a good foundation if we want to reach out to people. And again, it's a pioneer work. So the church consists of new converts. Paul pens this letter maybe 18 months after he visited that city. Verse 1, for you, brethren, know, or for you yourself know, brethren, that our coming to you is not in vain. And, and he speaks of our coming and by the greeting formula in chapter 1, we find out that, that it was Silvanus, Timothy, and Paul together. They came together as a team, a missionary journey, and they were on this journey to, 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 to evangelize, take care of new converts. You know, it's good when you have more people taking care of a convert. If you have a baby or a child, a little child in your household, dad, it's good to help out mom caring for the baby. Maybe there are older siblings they help to care or grandparents. So we work as a team with our new converts, our follow-up director, our pastor will, will, will appoint the team. And usually it's two. But 
if there is a person with high maintenance, we probably have three or four people doing the follow-up. So Paul, he sees the fruit, and, and he says, it was not in vain. So there were converts, and it was a very young church full of young believers. And thank God that revival has, has broken out. And, and Paul, he reflects on his work in Thessaloniki, and we labored hard night and day, verse 9. His work was not in vain, and that's encouraging. Isn't it true? It's good when our work is not in vain. When we do labor and when we see fruit, when we see results, it makes a difference. Your work is not in vain. That's all what counts. So let's look at how, how Paul approaches this task. Verse 3, for our exhortation was not of deceit, nor uncleanness, nor in guile, the expanded Bible. We do not sell the word of God for a profit as many other people do. And I know, church, this is not a deep revelation. It's Friday morning, okay? Conference Friday morning. We had, we, we had a great time. And I, I try to keep it simple <laughs> this morning. Try to do something practical. Not of deceit. Greek, plané. Church is not for business. And Paul writes this because he knows that there is a problem. And isn't it that people always say, watch out, they only want your money. And this is why we don't have sales parties in church. No tubber party. Avon makeup. Laundry. Cleaning products, you know, all kinds of things, you know. So, some people, they just want to make money, and there is a potential in a new customer, new convert. But of course, he would need an insurance. You know, I can help him out. I can hook him up. <laughs> verse, verse, verse 5, for neither at any time did we use flattering words nor a cloak for covetousness. Paul says, I was not after your money. Verse 6 and 7, New Living Translation, as apostles of Christ, we certainly had the right to make some demands of you, but instead we were like little children among you, or we were like a mother feeding and caring for her own children. Real ministry is a desire to serve people, not to have people serve you. Amen. There is a big difference. And when he says in verse 6, we had the right to make some demands as apostles of Christ. The word demand in, in Greek is baros. And it means to put on a load, a burden, a weight. In other words, we had the right to make claims. But we did not because we understood we have not yet the relationship for it to make demands. And, and, and this is deep. Sometimes disciples, they ask me, Pastor, can I say this and that to this new convert? And, and you know, it is, it is sometimes pretty hard to, to give them this, this idea. And I ask, how is your relationship with this new convert? Can you speak into his life? Because you cannot force people. You, you cannot tell them to become disciples. Go in all the world and make disciples. We are to make disciples. We cannot force anyone to be a disciple. And of course, there is a real frustration. You know, when you see the potential, like Pastor Success just preached, there is a potential, and you think, hey, he should reach his potential, and you try to push, and you try to do, and it can be frustrating. But, and, and your motive could be to their best advantage, but they just don't want, they're not, not ready yet to take up the cross. And you must learn wisdom and not demand things. Verse 7, we were gentle among you just as a nursing mother cherishes her own children. And here is a strong natural hint how to work with new converts. They are children. They are babies. And, and babies cannot make their bed. Babies cannot carry out the garbage. They cannot do that. So though infants, they won't go a day without messing their clothes. That's infants. You know, they, they can't eat by themselves yet, and you don't scold toddlers for that. You're still in bed. You slept 18 hours. You get your lazy butt out of bed. <laughs> so, 
You, you don't treat a baby like that. That's... A child needs time to mature, to function, to become an adult. And you must deal wisely with new converts. The saying of Pastor Mitchell, Bandage and happy juice. They need plaster on their ouch, and then they need happy juice. They need encouragement. They need to know that God loves them and that there is hope and that God can heal them. And this is all what Jesus did in the first years, the first time of his ministry, feeding people and healing them. Verse 5. But some of the... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Wrong side. <laughs> so what a new convert needs, food. Not necessarily McDonald's or Nando's. So <laughs> it's the word of God. <laughs> First Corinthians 3, 2. For I fed you with milk and not with solid food. For until now, you were not able to receive it. You, you feed a small child with a spoon, soft food, things they can handle Verse 8, so affectionately, longing for you, we were well pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you had become dear to us. Affection and love, and, and that speaks of friendship. People need to know that you are their friend. And it's a wonderful ability to connect with people on a friendship level. And you can speak into their lives. And I'm not talking about flattery. It's, it's like a bank account. You have to have a deposit before you can withdraw. Something, something from your relationship account, you know, that, that, that's ministry. You know, in, in ministry, when you, when you challenge something of someone, it's like you withdraw from your relationship account with that person. The problem is if you have no money on your bank, you cannot pay this card. If you have no relationship with the convert, with the person, you know it's very hard you know, to, 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 to ask them for certain things. And that's just the way how many older Christians are. They don't have the ability to speak into their life. They don't have the credibility to speak into their lives. The right. But when you serve people, then you save up credit with people. And when you go an extra mile, when you, when, you, when, you, when you show them that you care about them, when you are an example, when you, when you are consistent, when you're not taking advantage of them, and when you do that, that's like a deposit in a friendship account. And then... Once you challenge them about their life, you have the capital to make a withdrawal. And because you made a deposit and you made it in the spirit of love. See what Paul accomplished, verse 14. For you, brethren, became imitators of the churches of God, which are in Judea, in Christ Jesus. That is back in the Holy Land. That's back in Prescott. Imitators of the churches, reproduction. They became like their role models, and that's great, but it's also a scary thing. You have to consider that, that the people we disciple become like us. And it's not only the pastor who makes disciples, we all make disciples. We all have an effect on people, we all have influence on people, and we all teach. And, and you have to ask yourself some question, what do I teach them? And even if you're not directly involved with them, but what do you teach them beside eating? What, what is your goal? What is your focus? So what is the goal in follow-up? It is to make disciples, men and women. The goal of successful follow-up ministry is to make yourself redundant. See in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6 and 7, and you became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became examples to all in Macedonia and Achaia who believe. And that's a concept. You yourself become unemployed. And, and first they follow you and then they get it, 
Then there is a transference, and then they become examples for other people. That's the goal. And that's powerful. You became followers of us and of the Lord. As a pastor, you, you're not a life manager. You know, this, this, you know you, we are not called to manage lives. What, what, what it is, you need to connect people with God. And when people are connected with Jesus, everything else will fall into place. Let's, let's end with some practical thoughts with some nuts and bolts. So we, we have to start with the role model if you want to produce beautiful results. Follow-up starts with the worker. You know, for a surgeon, it's tremendously helpful if he first removes the beam out of his own eye <laughs> before he starts his surgery. <laughs> so there is a need for self-examination and we are usually concerned with examining the new convert, but we should start with ourselves. Examine yourself, 2 Corinthians 13, 5, whether you are in faith, in the faith, prove your own self. You know, successful follow-up is more than, than giving information. It's impartation of life. Verse 8, New Living Translation. We loved you so much that we shared with you not only God's good news, but our own lives too. And, and we know, we heard it quite often, truth is better caught than taught. John 13, so after Jesus had washed their feet, you know what Jesus did and they understood. And it all starts with you and with the altar. A real conversion makes discipleship much easier. And, and without conversion, uh, 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 discipleship will be very hard because you, you cannot carry anyone to heaven. You cannot make anyone faithful or moral or spiritual. And, and if someone has not touched by God, it doesn't matter. You can visit him, you can pay food for him, you can iron the laundry, you can buy a car. But these people, you know, usually they will leave church and they will say, there is no love in this church. <laughs> At the altar, lead them through a simple prayer. You know, I take my time because it's, an, it's a very important moment at this altar. And, and then I give them the opportunity to talk to God themselves. And I say, I, I, I will stay with you here at the altar. I will pray for you, but there are probably things that you want to talk to God to. There are things in your heart, and, and, and I'm not listening what you pray. I, I, just, I, I just would be just next to this person, would put my hand on, and would, would start to pray silently for this person. I, I, would, I would bind certain things. I would lose certain things in, in, this, in this new convert with balance, sensitive, wise. New converts need help to follow the Lord. And, and usually, you know, it's you whom they follow first and which puts a great responsibility on you. If they are raw sinners, you are the first Christian raw model in their life. Before I got to know Pastor Neil Prosser, I've got to know the guys in the church and because, you know, they, they accompanied my first steps. And I went to prayer because they went to prayer. I went to evangelize because they did evangelize. And, you know, you should have contact with the new convert within the first 24, 48 hours at least. And, and it's good, you know, to, to talk to him and her because they need somebody to connect. They need a reference point when, when suddenly all hell breaks loose against their life. Four baby steps, quick steps for a new convert. Take him or her by the hand and walk together. One of the first things I, I recommend is they need a Bible. You come on, they need a Bible, a good translation. Pastor, Pastor Jay Nembat, he he showed us the difference between a good translation and a not-so-bad translation, huh? 
So they, they need a Bible and they need someone to explain the Bible to them. You know, you explain, the Bible, it's, it's not a book like any other book in this world. You know, the Bible, it's a book you don't have to start at the very beginning and read it through the end. You know, you, you tell them. You know, there is the Old Testament, there is the New Testament. In the Old Testament, this is the law, but for you, that's, that's a New Testament, that's a new covenant. This is what, what you get out of this, and, and probably you take some, some papers and you put some bookmark, bookmarks in it, and then they can, they can look at it. What new converts need is a certainty about their salvation. Who knows that the devil loves to condemn people, damnation, because of their faults, because of their weakness. And a new convert suffers from many attacks. Condemnation from the devil, a lack of security, of trust, certainty. And, and they're not sure if their sin are really forgiven. Give them some scriptures. John 5, 24. Most assuredly, I say to you, who hears my word and believes in him who has sent me, has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. First John 1 John 1.9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just. Yes, First John 2 verse 1, give them some scriptures and then put it in, you know, that in times of need they will, they will look at it and God can encourage them. Secondly, tell them how they can pray in Jesus' name. You can talk to God now by yourself. Talk to him about everything. Encourage them to pray. You know, I remember as a new convert, I was sitting in my room. It was hot. The fan was spinning. And, and I thought by myself, wow, that's powerful. I can talk to God, to the creator of heaven and earth. I, I can say words. I, I, can, I can share my life. This was so powerful. And I take my Bible and I, I looked at some scriptures brothers had shown me. That was great. The third thing, new converts should learn to be in church. Bring them to church. You don't have to lecture them. Just bring them to church and be there yourself. Please. <laughs> please. If, you know, don't come too late. And the next step is help to tell them about their faith. That's four steps. Read the Bible, pray, come to church, give testimony. And maybe you, you help them to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I, I remember brothers from church, you know, Gary, Kevin, and, and Stephen, and they took me evangelizing. And, and first I listened to what they said, what, how they talked. And, and Gary, he came to my house and, and he said, Frank, what are you doing? Nothing, <laughs> nothing to do. Let's go evangelizing. I said, what? I said, and, he, and he took me. Actually, Gary, he was a convert killer. He was very good praying with people. You know, he prayed with so many. But, but then pastor had to take care that he takes him off people. <laughs> so, so I got saved on a, on a Friday, on a Friday night. Gary prayed with me. And he came over on Saturday. We just met casual. He came over, picked me up for church on Sunday. And on Monday, he took me out outreaching, door knocking. <laughs> New convert. <laughs> right into it. <laughs> so that's how I was introduced, you know, to a Christian lifestyle. But then Pastor Neil, he made sure that he also had other disciples having influence in my life. You know, Kevin, you know, we, we evangelize. What are you doing evangelizing? Let's go. But we also did Bible study. The first book I've read in the Bible was the book of Revelation. It's all powerful, you know, spaced out. And, you know, we did a Bible study. And, you know, six months later, I was out there with new converts. And what that means is that then you become the example. You have become our imitators and the lords. And then the day comes that they will do it all by themselves, and you are out of your job. But until that happens, you and I, we have to do a job. So when we go back tomorrow, back to our cities, and you know we have a conference team calling the congregation, sounding the alarm in 2022. You know, when you hear this trumpet blow, when you go forward, you go out, evangel make sure 
that someone follows you. Make sure that you have someone, you re reach back, you know, reach back to someone and call, come on, let's go together. Come on and introduce him or her in the things of God, and God will bless that. That's all I have this morning. Thank you for that. <laughs>